here we are in 2022 celebrating a pivotal moment in our history, the history of the globe. Now here's one of the problems with that. In the day and age that we live in today, we find, we hear, watch a little bit of news, and there seems to be this push to rewrite history, to perhaps even erase history, to change it to a whole other narrative that's inaccurate. And yet, here I am today, posed with the challenge to make something that happened 2,000 years ago relevant. In a culture that's trying to tell us the last 200 don't matter. So I hope you'll go with me today on this journey that we're about to step into. If you'll open your Bibles to John chapter 20. And this morning, I just want to give you a little bit of heads up, a little bit of warning. Our good friend Matt Salas is wearing the perfect belt today. Matt, stand up and show that thing off. Come on. Come on, baby. His belt is a seat belt. It's a seat belt. So this morning, we're going to buckle up. We're going to buckle up. Come on. I can't believe you won't show it off. Man. It's so cool. I, like, man, I, it's, it's fun. John chapter 20. I'm going to read uh, the, the whole of what would be the Easter story, the whole of the resurrection story, and then we're going to take a little time to unpack it. Um, I learned a long time ago from a mentor of mine that if you start your sermon with Scripture, at least you get the first part right. So we're going to read this story. I hope you'll go along with me in John chapter 20, verse 1. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone, well, the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciples, the one whom Jesus loved. I, I, I find it awesome that the guy that wrote this book, John, refers to himself in the third person. Yeah, you know, the one Jesus loved. I was kind of hanging out. And Mary said to them, they have, taken, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they've laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together. I, lo I love this. I lo here's John. But the other, uh, the other disciple, yeah, well, he outran Peter. I'm pretty fast. And he reached the tomb first, and stooping to look in, he saw that the linen clothes lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen clothes lying there and, and the face cloth. Some translations refer right there to the napkin. The napkin. Which, was, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen clothes, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciples who had reached the tomb first also went in, and, and he saw and believed, for as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Verse 10, then the disciples went back to their homes, but Mary, Mary stood weeping outside the tomb, and as she wept, she stood to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting there where the body of Jesus had lain. One at the head and one at the feet. And verse 13 says, They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Well, she said to them, They have taken away my Lord. What a great line. They didn't remove her God. They removed her Lord. They have taken away my Lord. <clears throat> and I do not know where they've laid him. Having said this, she turned around and, and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know who he was. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, quite interesting that he was the gardener in the beginning. She said to him, sir, if, if, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've, you've laid him and, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni. 
Jesus said to her, do not cling to me, for I have, I have not yet ascended to the Father, but, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. That's an important line there. My Father and your Father, my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord and that he had said these things to her. Let's pray one more time. And then learn how to unpack this and, and, and wear this story Monday through Saturday. Jesus, I thank you for this amazing, this amazing narrative. I thank you that our lives in this room are impacted by you. And, and I pray that today that we, we can't help but be influenced more towards your kingdom because we took time to read this powerful story. And all of City Church said, Amen. Amen. You know, and and in most churches, there's a children's ministry, and in most children's ministries, there's a little Johnny. So one teacher one week is teaching children, and she's teaching them about Easter, and she says, what did it mean when Jesus came out of the tomb? And of course, little Johnny is, I got this. Well, teacher's a little afraid to ask, but he's the only one with his hand raised. So she says, little Johnny, what did it mean when Jesus came out of the tomb? And little Johnny said, it means we're having six more weeks of winter. <laughs> Think about some of the myths that we have. Think about what we've done with Easter. I love Easter. I love the celebration. I don't get stuck on the vernacular of Easter, resurrection, I, whatever you want to call it. It's awesome. But one part that I struggle with is the mascot. How did a bunny become the mascot of Easter? Of all the mascots, Easter gets a bunny. A bunny that lays eggs. Have we thought about this? There's lots of mascots. Santa, not a bad one. I kind of get that. Tooth Fairy works. Jack Frost, Father Time, a freaking bunny <laughs> that lays eggs and then hides the eggs. What kind of a freak show is that? Couldn't we get a better mascot for Easter than a bunny? But here's the deal. I think in our time, majority of people that don't know the life-changing power of Jesus lump Jesus in with all the other myth mascots. Just another one. Just a, another one. I, I have a job today to help you take the resurrection from being historical to being personal. That the resurrection is not an event of 2,000 to 22 years ago. That the resurrection is not something we read in perhaps an archaic thing called the Bible. That the resurrection is not something that I do believe in as a Christian, but it doesn't really influence my every day. Friend, if the resurrection isn't personal enough to influence your every day, I don't know that you understand the power of the resurrection. I have a job today to try to have us make the journey of taking the resurrection from historical to personal. I hope you'll join with me on this ride. Buckle up. We should have given out belts today. We should have. Everybody comes in and gets a seat belt. <laughs> John 20. Listen to this. John 20. This is an important part that we read this. John 20, verse 30 says, Now Jesus, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. 
But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Listen to me. John's saying, there's a whole lot of others I could have written. He says in another part, if I'd have written just his miracles, there is not enough room on the planet to hold the books. John is saying, of the three and a half years that I was chilling with Jesus, I can't even help you imagine what could be written. So what I did write was what really matters. I dialed in on the most specific, life-changing, powerful parts of this dude's life I could give you. And part of that is John very clearly gave us the story of the resurrection. This guy who could have written volumes, could have written about anything else, chose in the middle of his narrative, you have to hear this story. And you can't hear it through historical archives. You've got to hear it through personal relationship. Wow. He's... Do we, do we ever really get hit with that? Like I was driving down the street the other day and I saw one of our favorite signs today. All of us today love our favorite sign that we all look at is gas prices. We all check it out. We used to never pay attention. I don't know, I gotta buy it anyway. Nowadays it's like I gotta, I gotta take out a loan to fill up the lawnmower. I'm driving by and I saw a sign that said $4.99 and I just said out loud, $5 a gallon. And it hit me and I said, like, what? And I said to myself, self, say that again. And I did. I like to obey me. And I said, $5 a gallon. I don't care what your political persuasion is. That statement should blow our mind. And yet, when we talk about Jesus is alive, we're like, yeah, I know. Want to go to Starbucks and complain about gas? I'm going to spend six bucks on the drink that I waited in the drive through and spent $4 on gallon of gas to get we are more impressed with culture because we haven't made the resurrection personal. It's still historical. We have to graduate from that today. And by no means am I going to be able to comprehensively give you all the ways that this should be a personal experience. I'm going to give you three. Three three ways, three purposes, three reasons the resurrection needs to matter. A, a standard old three-point sermon. In Bible school, I asked a Bible teacher, how many, how many good points should a sermon have? And my mentor, a guy named Ed Vigno, said, well, Russ, at least one. <laughs> I don't know if he was encouraging me or revealing. I want to give you this first one. The resurrection is a picture of God's eternal character. The resurrection is a picture of God's eternal character. Listen, we cannot, you cannot give a quality answer about the questions of God without really knowing his character. Because there's a whole lot about him that is mystery. There's a whole lot about him we don't understand. His ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts higher than our thoughts. There's so much that we in our humanity don't have answers for. It really is okay. And it's, it, even as a pastor, I've come to the place of being comfortable saying, I don't know. I don't know. But the foundation of that I don't know has to be that I do know the character of our God. And the resurrection is a picture of his eternal character. When we're, when we're reading the scripture, and you hear me refer to this often, it's important that we practice what's called the law of first mention. 
Basically what that is, is when you're reading a portion of scripture, whether it's a word or a storyline, and it catches you and you want to know what's really the core, what's the, what's the Hebraic belief right here, what's the meaning of that word, you need to go all the way back to the first time it's ever mentioned. That's, that's the filter that the rest of this comes through. When we read that in the, the Christmas story that Joseph didn't know Mary, like what the heck does that mean? Well, that no comes all the way back to Adam and Eve, where Adam knew Eve. There was intimacy. It's important that we go back to the law of first mention to accurately get a, get a grip on the rest of it. And for us to really understand his character, the bottom line foundation of his character that will help his resurrection become personal, I have to go back to the law of first mention. What's the first place that his character is talked about. I'm going to tell you something right now. Here's the first place of his character. Please get this in you. Really, really simple and yet profound. God is good. No, 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 no. Don't hear me say that he does good. No, he is good. There's a big difference. He is good. Psalm 119.68 says this. Look at this. Psalms 119.68. You are good and you do good. I challenge you to get up in the morning and start saying that to yourself out loud about five times before you start your day. You're good and you do good. Yeah, but what about, I don't know, but he's good. And he does good. But what about this broken relationship? I don't think he's good. And he does good. What about this, 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 this diagnosis? I, I, I don't really know. I know he's good. And he does good. What about this unexpected expense? I, I don't know. But he's good. And he does good. It's like the line from the wine, wine? From the wine, the witch, and the wardrobe. I'm telling you right now, it's a great movie. That wine, witch, and wardrobe. What the heck? If we can edit that out, that'd be good. <laughs> See, this is why a guy should stick to his notes. This is why. There's a line in the movie, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, and the, it's about the lion. And so the question is asked, is he, is he nice? And the answer is, oh, no. But he's good. But he's good. You do good because you are good. You are good, so you do good. Repeat that to yourself. Get that in you. If you don't, you're not in the habit of memorizing scripture, memorize this. You, you can do it. It's six words. You are good and do good. It's all you got to do. And let it get into your system. So how do we go back to the law of first mention of his goodness? Listen, listen, in... In the Bible, there's this word called glory, and it's a very big word. It's a very, very big word, and I could take you through what the Hebrew of it means or through what the Greek of it means, but that still wouldn't, wouldn't really give it the emphasis. I could tell you that it has the word Shekinah, and it means heavy, or it means weighty, or it means the cloud presence. There's, there's, a, there's a lot that I could give that, that we could spend time looking at just the word glory, but the most simple, easiest definition of glory is what are you known for? What, what are you celebrated for? Don't we say that once in a while about people? Well, here she is in all of her glory. After service, we'll ask Matt, can I see your belt buckle? Here it is in all of its glory. It's, it's essentially what are you known for? 
Or what are you, what are you famous for? Exodus 33, a lot first mentioned about God being good starts like this. It says, Moses said, please show me your glory. In fact, so Moses is saying, listen, remember the conversation. Moses is talking, and, 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 and earlier in the conversation, back in the beginning of Genesis, not in, not in 33, but in the beginning, of, or the beginning of the conversation in Exodus, where Moses was meeting God, and he says, what's your name? And God says, my name's I Am. And Moses is like, I really could use a last name. Like, what's, like, I am Bob? And God says, well, I am that I am. And so that travels with Moses. So finally, at one point, Moses says, you know what? Show me, your, show me what you're known for. See, all the other gods of Egypt were, were known. The, the god of the locusts, and in fact, all the ten plagues were from gods of Egypt. The god of the, of the Nile River, and the god of, of the frogs, and the god of the, 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 the lice. and it, 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 They were all gods. And, and so Moses is saying to God, hey, show me what you're famous for. That'll help. Show me, show me what you're known for. Show me your glory. And God's immediate response and God said, I will have my goodness go before you. I'll show you I'm good. That's what I'm known for. That's what I'm famous for. I'm famous for being good. And if the resurrection is historical and not personal, you don't know what he's known for he's good let me show you my goodness anything I read anything that comes in even when I read this anything that comes into my being has to go through the filter of knowing he's good that's what he's known for he's good let me give you one more example of how good he is, and then we'll, we'll move on. Genesis 3.22 says this. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. Watch this. This is so interesting. Now lest he reach out with his hand and take also the tree of life and eat and live forever. Now notice this. I didn't, I didn't change this. And live forever. There's a dash and a quotation. This is an incomplete sentence. I love grammar. This is an incomplete sentence. Right in the middle of, of the scripture, in the middle of this thought, there's a sentence that doesn't get finished. We'll read it again. Now, lest he reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, it, it, it just, he doesn't finish the sentence. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out of the Garden of Eden. And so we read that and we go, man, God must have been ticked off. Like he made this garden. They ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now he's concerned about them eating from the other tree. So he boots their butt out of there. Like we're bouncing to Canaan. You're gone. No, no, it wasn't that at all. His goodness was on display because he knew that if Adam and Eve, after falling from eating the tree of knowledge of good and evil, if in that fallen state, they took a bite from the tree of life, they would live forever in a fallen state. And he's so good, he removed them from that temptation. It wasn't about him being angry. It was about his goodness protecting his people from living in a fallen state for all eternity. Today, you can read, today you can do your own study. In the book of Revelation, there's three times the tree of life is referred to and we are allowed to eat from the tree of life because we're in the redeemed state. He did it out of his goodness, not out of his wrath. You Okay. Oh, I'm going to keep going. <laughs> the resurrection is 
a picture of God's eternal character. Secondly, the resurrection is a picture of God's eternal grace. It, it's a picture of his eternal grace. We, we don't really understand grace. We, we often insult grace. There's a, there's a teaching out there that, that I, I, I love to remind you of from time to time because it's, it's, so, it's so pervasive but so inaccurate. A teaching that goes on like this. Well, you just need to forgive and forget. And then we struggle through life. Why can't I forget? Have I not forgiven? Maybe I have forgiven. I don't know if I've forgiven. I can't forget. Let me just say something to you. Take that pressure off. Grace, God, would never ask you to do something that he wouldn't do. So we say that God forgets. Well, as soon as I say that, he's no longer God. He's either all-knowing or he's not. I can't have both. And if he's forgetting something, he's no longer all-knowing. And then, and then, if he forgets my sin, oh boy, there's a host of people that he needs to apologize to because he wrote theirs down. But the insult to grace is this. See, the personal message of grace is, I know you're dirt, and I love you anyway. And the resurrection is a picture of his eternal grace. In the, in the Jewish Hebrew world, they have a, a holiday that they call Yom Kippur. And in antiquity, what would happen during Yom Kippur is they would pull two goats from their herd and they would try to get the most identical looking goats. Two goats that were most similar in height and in color and in, 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 in personality. They would try to pick two identical goats. And during Yom Kippur, the practice was the high priest would come out and, and he would put his hand on the head of one of the goats that, that lost by selection and he would confess the sins of Israel over that goat. All the sins of Israel. And then that goat would leave the building. It would be released from the building and sent out to, into the wilderness. It was the scapegoat. The other goat that didn't have any sins put on it was slaughtered. And when the slaughtered goat, when the goat, when the goat that was slaughtered was finally slaughtered, they would yell, the goat has left the building. In other words, there's no more grace, or there's no more sin, there's no more guilt. There's no more. The goat has left the building. Why? Because the innocent one got slaughtered. Yom Kippur. Let's watch a New Testament Yom Kippur. John 18, 38. He, being Pilate, went back outside to the Jews and told them, I find no guilt in him, Jesus, but you have a custom that I should release one man for you at the Passover, so you, do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? They cried out again, not this man, but Barabbas. Now, Barabbas was a robber. We taught last week that a robber takes something that's not theirs. So here's the exchange. You look at the name Barabbas. Barabbas equals Bar Abba, which means the son of Abba, which means the son of the father, which equaled the scapegoat. Barabbas was Bar Abba, the son of the father. We know that Jesus in the book of Mark said this, Mark 14, 36, he said, and Jesus said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Jesus was another form of Abba. So with Jesus being Bar Abba, Jesus, son of Abba, was the slaughtered goat, the innocent one. The New Testament 
Yom Kippur was when the people said that we want Barabbas, Abba, not Jesus, Abba. What's the point? Let, let me listen to me. Dial in. Listen to me. Get this. Here's the point. If the resurrection is historical and not personal, I will settle for an illegitimate father. Did you hear me? It's worth repeating. If the resurrection is simply historical and not personal, I will settle for an illegitimate father. Identical looking goats for Samuel 16, 7 brings us down. It lands, for the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. When he looks on my heart, what father does he see me serving? It's super important for us to live with the picture of grace and be able to say the goat has left the building I don't carry the guilt I don't serve a false father I don't, I don't let poor decisions that Jesus died for hold me possession anymore because I don't serve a false father I don't judge other people any longer because I don't serve a false father. No, though that goat has left the building. I don't live in fear anymore because that goat has left the building. I don't serve that father. I, I, don't, I don't let anxiety own me anymore. Why? Because that goat has left the building. I don't serve an illegitimate father. I don't wonder my identity in life. I know who I am. I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable in who I am. Why? Because I don't serve an illegitimate father. The goat has left the building. I don't have to worry about a doctor's diagnosis and let it own me. Why? Because the goat has left the building. I will live in a way that makes his resurrection personal, that brings grace to my life, that reminds me every day which father I serve. And the goat has left the building. Finally, the third picture. Resurrection is the picture of God's eternal hope. Hope is amazing. Hope isn't a wish. There's a difference. You know, what the, you know he's the God of hope. You know what's cool about hope? Hope allows me to enjoy the emotions of what I'm hoping for before I get it. I get to enjoy the emotions of what I'm hoping for before I get it. And, 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 and the resurrection is a picture of eternal hope. John, we talked about it. John was meticulous in what he recorded. He was very careful in what he recorded. He was very sure in his short narrative of the volumes he could have written. The resurrection from the dead. Some people want to would like to argue over the course of time. Well, he didn't really die. It was a magic trick. <laughs> yeah, like you can you can take a, you can be brutally beaten for eighteen hours, and then nailed to a cross for another six, and then be stabbed in the side and watch blood and water come out, and still hold your breath for three days. You didn't really die. I'm like, bro, that takes more faith than that he rose from the dead. Like that storyline, I just get covered with the spirit of slap.
Tracy and I last week went to a place called Ruth's Christ Steakhouse. Mm, and let me tell you, it was free. <laughs> I want to make that very clear. What do you want to do? In and out or free steak? We went to a dinner that was provided for us at Ruth Christ's Steakhouse. And I don't deny, like it was a treat. It was a treat. Tracy, who loves steak, says it was the best steak of her lifetime. And she's not one to exaggerate. <laughs> Have you met her husband? <clears throat> Up to this point, what's been our favorite steak was when we lived in Houston, Texas. When we lived in Houston, Texas, a Valentine's Day came. We were on staff. I was an executive pastor at a church, large church of about 3,500, and, and, and I was an executive pastor, and we just lived in Houston a short time, and it was our first Valentine's Day to be in Houston, and so I went to a guy that was, that was active in the church, and I said, hey, 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 and this was, this was Sunday. Valentine's Day was Monday, and I said to my buddy, hey, if you were going to take your wife to someplace special for Valentine's Day, where would you take her? And he says, bro, you got to take her to Papa's Steakhouse. I'm like, done. It's going to happen tomorrow night. Papa's Steakhouse. And he goes, have a great night. And he shakes my hand and he walks away. As he walks away, I look and he left a $100 bill in my hand. I'm like, oh, the brother wants to bless me. <laughs> so the next day I call Papa's Steakhouse. Hey, I'd like to get some reservations for tonight. The gal on the phone was like, you aren't from around here, are y'all? Like, we've been booked up for the last three weeks. I'm like, well, do you have like a waiting list? She's like, yeah, we, we got a waiting list. It's got 62 names on it. I don't believe we'll have that many cancellations. Would you like me to put y'all's name on it? Like, nah. So I call my buddy Joel. And I say, hey, call Papa's. They're booked. No room. 62 on a waiting list. I can't get in. Do you have any other suggestions? He goes, yeah, I got the suggestion. Hang on. I'll call you right back. So Joel hangs up. He calls me back. A few minutes later, he goes, hey, you have a reservation at Papa's Steakhouse at 715 under Mike Sims. I'm like, booyah. Thank you, my brother. We're going to Papa's Steakhouse. We have no clue. We're from Montana, folks. Like, like dressing up for us is not wearing overalls, you know? So we, <laughs> so we go to Papa's Steakhouse, and, and luckily I wore a sport coat, because you pull up, there's a sign that says sport coat required, and we are driving a 1997 Suburban. And in the parking lot is a Lamborghini and a Maserati, I'm like, dear Jesus, deliver us. And we pull in, and these five little guys come, and they take our car. I've never had valet parking up to this point. These little dudes, they just take your car. It's like, hey, welcome, get out. Here you go. I'm like, yeah, park it by that Maserati. <laughs> Y'all have a good night. So we go in, and I, and I walk up to the table, the, 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 the lady that's standing there, and, and uh, I said, hi, um, we have a 715 reservation, and she's looking down at the list. I said, a 715 for Mike Sims. And I promise you, she goes, Mr. Sims, we will be right with you. And I'm like, no, no. And she's gone. Like, All right. So we're standing there waiting for her, and we hear guys, the place is packed. And we hear people yelling across, hey, Johnny, how'd you get reservations? I called a month ago. How'd you get yours? I called just three weeks ago. I'm like, I called today. <laughs> so they come and they take Tracy and I and they say, oh, please come with us. And they take us to this little private room. There's like six tables in this room. This little private room with lighting and ambiance. And, and, I'm, and I'm like, this, <clears throat> we ain't in Kansas anymore, Toto. And, 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 and they sit us down, and, and so the, this guy pulls, um, he, he pulls my chair out. 
And I sit down and he slides me in. And then he takes a napkin off the table and he puts a napkin on my lap. I'm like, this is weird. Stop it. So they bring us the menu. And I look at the menu and I'm like, oh, <laughs> that's why Joel gave us $100. That's why. Right, right there. So we order, and of course you get bread, you get the whole thing, and so we're sitting there eating, and the dude, we're eating, and he comes along with this little scraper thing, and he cleans my crumbs up. I'm like, that's fun. That's crumbs for. <laughs> so we finish eating. And they bring us, the, they bring us, they bring us the, 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 the wine list. And, and, and we, we don't drink, but that, well, let's take a look at that. So we flip it over, and I'm looking at it, and I'm like, oh, snap. Tracy, how would you like a glass of wine? She's like, no. I said, no, I think we should get a glass of wine. Look at that first one. And the first one was $600 a glass. And you could order it with a $55 cigar. I'm like, how much of that cigar can I get for five bucks? wondering so we finish our meal and 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 I have to use the restroom so I take my napkin and I put it on my plate and I leave and while I'm gone the little guy with the scraper thing comes and he takes my napkin and he folds it and he places it on the back of my chair so I come back and I'm like that's weird so we're telling people the story down there and I didn't know this about that culture but in that culture in that in that very hospitable southern culture, that when you are finished eating, you wad up your napkin and put it on the plate. But if you're coming back, you fold it and set it on the back of the chair. John 20, verse 6. Then Simon Peter came following him, and went to the tomb. And he saw the linen clothes lying there. And the napkin. Which had been on Jesus' head. Not lying with the linen clothes. But folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who reached the tomb first also went in. And they made the resurrection personal. He's coming back. coming back he folded his napkin and he's coming back Abigail if you guys will come up I want to challenge you today this personal relationship with Jesus Christ is not just something that I do on Sunday. It's something that should influence every part of my life. Every sphere of my life should be filtered through the power of this resurrected Christ. That can't happen if the resurrection is a historical event and not a personal experience. Even his disciples didn't believe until the resurrection was personal. And why is it important? I'll tell you why it's important. He's coming back. He's left us every indication. And he's coming back. He folded the napkin and set it away from the rest. It wasn't an accident. He wants us to know that he is so good. And his, his desire for us is so personal that he's coming back to get us.
Some people want to argue this point. Why would a loving God, a good God, prepare a hell for people? Oh, he didn't. We read that he prepares a room for you and I. And he's coming back. He's coming back. And between now and then, the goat has left the building. The goat has left the building. Will you stand with me, please? We're going to close a little bit different today. I'm going to... The band is going to take us in a song. But before we get there, we, we, I'm going to ask if you would just please close your eyes this morning and bow your head and give, give room for privacy for those around you. And I'm going to ask two questions in this moment of allowing privacy to those around us. Perhaps today, the personal part has to start of the relationship. Perhaps today, you're in this room and you do not have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. You may have at one time and turned away or you've never invited him in. But today would be the day you'd like to begin that personal journey new or once again. If I'm talking to you, I'm going to ask right where you're at if you'll just slip your hand up and say, Pastor, pray for me. I need to get my heart right with Jesus today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else to join these five? I'm going to pray over you five real quickly. And here's all I ask from you is that as I'm praying, if you will just, while I'm praying, just either whisper or say boldly, yes. Because the Bible says if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, you're saved. And today, as I pray for him to meet you in the place of your raised hand, if you would just say yes and receive his grace today. So Father, over these five that raise their hands in this room today, I ask right now that you meet them. Let your grace, your goodness, and your grace and your eternity show up right where they are. Show them your, your desire to forgive. Show them your goodness to protect. And show them your desire to return. On this day, I thank you for those who were bold enough to say, today, I need to get right with Jesus. And as they say yes to you right now, you show them you have said yes to them over the tunnel of time. And that will not change. Secondly, if you're in this room, I'm going to ask you to put your hand on your heart as we often close at City Church. With your heads down and your eyes closed, will you be honest? And will you say, either quietly or out loud, Lord, I want the resurrection to be personal. I need the resurrection to be personal. Please help me see how to make the resurrection personal. Please let me see the lion of the tribe of Judah. Please let me see the lion of the tribe of Judah.
song a lot of times but there's something that I just want to share with you guys um, quickly it's from Revelation 5 it says that uh, this was uh, John talking he said that I saw a strong angel proclaim with a loud voice who's worthy enough to open the scroll and to lose its its seal and no one in heaven and on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or look at it that is how powerful the scroll was. Like nobody, neither in heaven nor on earth could open it. Nobody could take a look at it. That is how powerful it was. So I wept much because no one was found worthy enough and to open and read the scroll or to look at it. But then one of the elders said to me, this is the part, of, this is the part I like. One of the elders said to me, do not we behold the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David has prevailed to open the scroll and to lose the seventh seal. That is how, that is the importance of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that is what we're celebrating today. Because he is worthy enough to open the scroll. We have heavens, thousands of angels were not worthy enough to open the scroll, but Jesus himself, by himself, was worthy enough because he died for us. He was given the privilege to look at it. He was given the privilege to read it. He was given the privilege to open it. So that is why we say hail to the Lion of Judah. We said the Lion is risen and the Lion is going to roll. The Lion is coming back for us. This song has a personal meaning to me today. I realize a lot today from reading this that this is not just a song, this is a proclamation. And we proclaim today that the Lion of the tribe of Judah is growing. And the Lion of the tribe of Judah is alive and he is going to... I don't know, I don't know, I don't know if you feel this. I don't know if you feel what I'm feeling right now. I don't know if you see what I'm seeing right now, but the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the El Shaddai, the tribe of, Je the tribe of David is going to rock. And we believe that this morning. We believe that this morning. So we say hell that the lion roar. We say together, say hell, hell, lion of Judah. Let the lion roar. Hell, hell, lion of Judah. Let the lion roar.
church. Come on. Come on. Hail the Lion of Judah. Hail. Hail. Hail the Lion of Judah. Church, he's alive. He's alive and he's, he's, he's so in love with you and he's so determined to be, be personal with you. May nothing that is of him ever become archaic because it's personal and he loves you. And if you leave here with any other message today, what happened 2,000 years ago is for you to know His goodness, for you to know His grace, and for you to know the promise of His eternity. And it's personal. He loves you, and He's good. He is good. And every part of your life, listen, when you're in relationship with Jesus, the goat has left the building. Come on.
Let me pray over you today. Father, I thank you that we get to gather. I thank you that we hail the lion of the tribe of Judah who stands in victory. I thank you for your goodness. I thank you for your grace. I thank you that you're returning. I thank you that today we can live knowing the goat has left the building because you were slaughtered for my sins. And I can live in the freedom, the hope, and the knowledge of the saving grace of Jesus Christ. May we never let that become archaic. I pray in the powerful name of the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the name of Jesus, the resurrected King, I pray. Amen. Amen. City Church, God bless you. Have a great week. Walk in power.